welcome to Divas with Debbie. Today we're looking at Jeremiah 3, 6 to 4, verse 4. So there is so much packed in here and I just want to start off with this theme that I feel like tugging on, which is faithfulness and faithlessness, but more with an emphasis on the positive. We're reminded by Jesus in Matthew 25, where he talks about the parable of the talents, which intrigues me greatly, where pretty much this master gives certain amounts to his servants and they are told to take care of what he gave them until he came back and he comes back and they have different reactions when two of them multiply what the master gave them by investing and one buries it and out of fear because they don't want to change or lose anything and they are not rewarded but the two who multiplied what the master gave them said this or receive this from the master. He says, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And this, this theme of faithfulness stretches throughout scripture, mostly with the revelation that God is the faithful one and we are not. But here, just for a moment, we have the Lord affirming his, his people, saying, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. And I think that just gives us a key insight into what faithfulness to the Lord can give us, is it leads into the joy of the Father, the joy of our Master. He rejoices when his people are faithful. So, right off the bat in Jeremiah 3, verse 6, we already see, again, this heart-wrenching moment that God is expressing through Jeremiah. And he says, Have you seen what she did, that faithful faithless one, Israel, has she went up on every high hill and under every green tree, there she played the whore. And I thought, after she has done all this, she will return to me. But she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. She saw that for all the adulteries of that faithless one, Israel, I had sent her away with the decree of divorce. Yet her treacherous Judah did not fear, but she went as well and played the whore. Because she took her whoredom lightly, she polluted the land, committing adultery with stone and tree. Yet for all of this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with her whole heart, but in pretense, declares the Lord. We have this image of God saying, Ugh! Like, my faithless Israel, I have loved you with an unconditional love. And you have gone off and chosen to worship whoever you want to. And like the prodigal son parable where the father is waiting, I just picture the same thing here. God is just waiting for Israel to return, but she doesn't. And not only does she not return, but her sister, Judah, Israel and Judah, sees what Israel is doing and said, huh, looks like she's having a good time. I think I'm going to join her. And they both are worshiping other gods and they don't return to the Lord with a whole heart. And there are so many things to pull out here, so I'll pull out a couple things, but things I noticed, one, like, 
she's called the faithless one. I want to be called the faithful one. But often I fit in that category of faithless one. Two, she took her sin lightly. That's in chapter 3, verse 9. Because she took her whoredom lightly, she polluted the land. And we see when we take our sin lightly, we forget that we're influencing others with that attitude too. If you think your sin just affects you, that is delusion. And I've seen it in my own life. Our own sinfulness has ripple effects. Whether or not we see those consequences now or generations later, our sin have cons has consequences. And especially to those who are near us, watching us live in that sin. She took her sin lightly. She did not return to the Lord with her whole heart. And what is God's answer to this situation? Yet again, he calls Israel faithless. And he, he asked Jeremiah to go and speak to Israel and say this. Return, faithless Israel, verse, th verse 12. I will not look on you in anger, for I am merciful. God's answer is, come back. Like, I, you think, you'd think I would be upset. And I'm upset. But I have mercy. And I just want you here. <laughs> I'd rather have you here than my wrath burn for you over there and God says I will not be angry forever beginning of verse 13 only acknowledge your guilt that you rebelled against the Lord your God and scattered your favors among foreigners under every green tree that you may not that you have not obeyed my voice hmm. God desperately just wants to be reunited with Israel. And you can see in his tone this great mercy already where he's saying, admit that you were guilty and come back. I'm going to extend mercy. And we get a glimpse into the heart of God where this is what he wants to do with returned Israel. Verse 15, and I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. God wants to lead Israel in the way of righteousness, in the way of knowledge, in the way of understanding, not in the way of darkness, but in the way of seeing clearly, enlightenment. And it's hard to not see this and think immediately of Jesus, who is identified, self-identified, and later on in scripture as the great shepherd, the good shepherd. And I already talked about that recently, about the good shepherd and his sheep, lays down his life for his sheep. So I won't dive into that, but there is another scripture that talks about the good shepherd that I want to re reference right now, which is in Hebrews. And it's at the end of Hebrews during the benediction, the blessing. And this is what we hear. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That's a lot in there. But pretty much... He's saying, may the God of peace bless you through his resurrected Jesus, through the, through the great shepherd of the sheep who will equip you to do good works. I mean, I can't even rephrase scripture that was like underwhelming versus the first reading. But what we see is, Jesus is our great shepherd. He is the one who will lead us, who will feed us with knowledge and understanding. 
through his word. And furthermore, it says, a shepherd after my own heart. God wants to return his lost sheep to himself so that he can lead them with people after his own heart. We see too this acknowledgement of disobedience and how obedience does lead to abundance. He says that when they return, like Jerusalem will be called the throne of the Lord, verse 17, and all the nations in the world will gather to it. And verse 17 towards the end says, they shall no more stubbornly follow their own evil heart. God wants to transform their hearts to hearts of faithfulness. And we see that obedience leads to abundance. And he, again, this, this passage is interesting to me because it's a huge mix of different metaphors. We get Israel as a whore, faithless wife. We have Israel as a sheep, like flock of sheep. We have Israel as children as well and as servants. Verse 14 talks about Israel as faithless children and the Lord is the master. And again, this theme comes up again in verse 19 where it says, and I thought you would call me my father and would not return from following me. Oh, it would, pardon, we're going to reread that. And I thought you would call me my father and would not turn from following me. That's on break. All of these are intimate relationships, that of a father and a son. And you can almost picture God seeing this little, maybe like a little toddler, and he's been holding the hand of his little toddler and says, come, follow me, versus running off like, the Lord is looking down at his children, wanting them to say, Abba, Father, I will follow you. And yet, he's met with this faithfulness. And right after that, verse 20, he says, Surely as a treacherous wife leaves her husband, so you have been treacherous to me, O house of Israel. He just keeps bouncing between these metaphors, which can be a little hard to find, but you see this extra added punch when he goes from children to a faith, a faithless wife, you know. A children running off and not following his dad is one thing. A wife going out and sleeping with tons of other people is a whole other deal. And a whole other heartbreak, and God's experiencing both heartbreaks at the same time. Verse 22 is the shocking one, though. I, I just want to narrow in on this. It says, Return, O faithless sons. I will heal your faithfulness. Behold, we come to you, for you are the Lord our God. This is the call and response that God wants to hear. He says, Return to me, and I'm going to heal your faithfulness, faithlessness and make you faithful. And the response is, Behold, we come to you, for you are the Lord our God. I mean, it almost makes me want to cry, just thinking about this call and response being exactly the heart of God. He wants to heal our faithlessness. He doesn't want to just have us come back and struggle and strive and be unable to commit to the Lord. He wants to heal our faithlessness. But that only happens when we return in repentance. And I'm struck yet again by this verse in 2 Timothy 13, 2.13, pardon, that says, or actually, let's start in 2.11. The saying is trustworthy. For if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, 
for he cannot deny himself. It's a fascinating verse segment. I can't get into it, all of it right now, but think about the, the situation here. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. Essential to the core of who God is is faithfulness. And we are faithful, faithless. We just mess up all the time. And we choose to worship other things. We choose to value other things. We choose pride over humility time and time again. But God remains faithful. And we can rest on that. We can lean into that truth, into that reality. And connecting that with this passage of, I will heal your faithlessness. Who but the king of faith, faithfulness can heal our faithlessness. He is the source of faithfulness, and we can depend and lean into that. And he desperately wants to hear that, Behold, we come to you, for you are the Lord our God. And we get further on this unfolding of this repentance that Israel could have, that God might be imagining through Israel, but also I pray it's prophetic that the nation of Israel and that all of us return to the Lord with this heart that says, for we have sinned against the Lord our God, verse 25. We and our fathers from our youth even to this day, and we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. Just that acknowledgement of our disobedience, that humble posture is exactly what God wants. And he, in, in healing our faithlessness, we get yet again another glimpse of what that looks like. How can God heal our faithlessness? This is what he says. Verse 3, For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts, O men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of your evil deeds. He's giving us the recipe for faithfulness. He's saying, break up the fallow ground and sow not among thorns. And it makes me think of the parable of the sower and the seed. The seeds that fell on the good seed or on the good soil could produce fruit and those that th fell among thorns um, the cares of this world choked out the life it could not put down roots and here is the recipe break up the soil in your heart so that God's word can come and be planted and grow and another part of the recipe of being faithful, another part of the recipe that God wants to do so that we can have faithful hearts and he can heal our faithlessness is the circumcision of the foreskin of your hearts. And again, it's a good reminder that this circumcision of the heart falls in the Old Testament because often we think of that as a revelation in the New Testament, at least for me, when, when God talks about the circumcision of the heart being what matters, not just of the body. And with that, I'm going to share where it comes in the New Testament, once in Romans and once in Deuteronomy, just to wrap that full circle. So we do see it in the New Testament. Romans 2.29, and it's important to know probably Paul is at the center of this debate in the early church. Should new believers, new converts um, who are not of the Jewish descent have to circumcise themselves? And it says, let's start at verse 28. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and a circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but 
from God. Paul's emphasizing that circumcision isn't what you do outwardly, physically. It's the Holy Spirit, the Lord, circumcising the heart, not of the law, the letter, not of just like what you do, but it's a matter of the heart with not seeking praise from man or validation from man, but from God. So Paul clarifies that to the church, but we also see from the voice of, from the mouth of God, what circumcision is. And this is a perfectly fitting passage because it's in Deuteronomy 30, in a passage about repentance and forgiveness, about God saying, return to the Lord your God, verse 2, with all your heart and your soul, and God will restore your fortunes, have mercy on you, gather you again. But verse 6 is what I want to narrow in on. It says, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that he that you may live. The recipe for faithfulness is for God to circumcise our hearts, which enables the, us to have the capacity to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, strength, so that we can live in abundance. And we, we want this. It's not like God saying, return to me so I can punish me, you. He's saying, return to me so that I can heal your faithlessness. Give you the capacity to be faithful in loving me. And yet with this promise that if we are faithless, he remains faithful. We are going to mess up time and time again. But God is going to remain faithful, extending this opportunity to be faithful. So this is a lot chew on. I hope you have a great day. Whoever ends up watching this ever, this could just be Debbie six months from now needing a little encouragement, but have a good day. Ciao!